We are here today um, on set of the Kevin Can Wait show, which is pretty exciting, but I'm super excited because our guest is Andy Fickman. Hello. Hello. Greetings and salutations. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the actual set of Kevin Can Wait. That is our living room. Almost always I am over there where your camera is, yelling action that way as actors act behind me. There you go. And today we're just going to have this wonderful like little chit chat it's together. It's kind of a nice quiet day. I like it. Yeah. So so you um, are kind of resting today. Is Monday usually your day of rest? Um, well, Monday's a little bit, usually we're in editorial uh, and getting caught up on the prep. We're, uh, so we usually do table reads on a Monday. This is a hiatus day for us, so it's a little bit of a rest, but there's no rest. It's where there's we no have rest. time to rest. You rest a long time from They're now. out doing go-karts right. you know, on their day off. Or That's right. <laughs> We were just roller, we were roller skating. <laughs> we were shooting roller skating last week. Yeah. So we were at hot skates roller skating, and so we uh, uh, everybody's body's probably just a little tired right now. Now, one of the things in a prior interview with someone else, I noticed that you said the reason that you became a director is that you didn't think that you had the movie star looks. But I think you're very handsome. So well, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Thank you. Know. you. <laughs> Not I. I appreciate you're that uh, so much. <laughs> you know. So many people have told me in the past that my looks are, well, movie star-ish, uh -huh. adjacent. Uh -huh. And <laughs> uh, I, uh, I appreciate, I, okay. like a character actor. I, right. um, I used to act when I was a kid growing up, did all the high school stuff, was actually on a theater scholarship and was doing theater. And I was in the middle of a, of a wonderful production uh, and uh, of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And as I was, watching it all unfold, I was having a bit of an out-of-body experience, and I thought, oh, I don't think I want to act. Wow. I think I want to direct. Yeah, and because you saw something that you wanted to tweak differently? I think I was, I, yeah, I was looking around. I was uh, part of the players group, and so there was five of us up kind of watching the action unfold, and so I was watching the actors, again, wonderful actors, but then I would be like, oh, it might be funny if he moved over there. Oh, what it would be if he could do... Then I realized as an actor, I just didn't, you know, I was focused on my one character and the director was focused on the entire piece. And that really, that was a really big moment for me because it helped wow. me kind of redirect my mindset and what sort of got me here today. You're like, I'll have more fun doing that. I, I did. So and to this day, every once in a while when someone talks about me acting or doing a small part, I've done it. I did a small part in Reefer Madness and uh, uh, my first movie, Who's Your Daddy? And I just hated I hated being in front of the camera for two seconds. That now, was enough. I was reading too. Who you went from? Who's your daddy? To Disney. That's like an interesting, you know, change it, of events there. It went well. Okay. Went from Reefer Madness. Yes. Uh, Which was award-winning, by the way. Award-winning, two times the uh, High Times Stony Award. Um, and we got nominated for some Emmys, and uh, we won the Deauville Film Festival for audience, uh, premier jury audience award. So, but yeah, I went, if you look at the early stuff on my career, uh, Who's Your Daddy, uh, Reefer Madness, Anaconda, which I, was my first movie to produce. Uh, and then all of a sudden you could see a leap where I'm now doing a tremendous amount of family entertainment. Yes. Um, but. Uh, but I still love it all. Uh, last year we did Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse for Paramount, which was a very hard R-rated zombie movie. Uh, we're doing Heather's musical. So you want to show musical. diversity, I guess, is yeah. that you can direct many different types yeah, of things. Yeah, that one I got. That one I was a producer on. <laughs> okay. But I think whether I'm producing, writing, or directing, uh, I always want to show diversity. But it's also about what I respond to as a, like an audience member. I just want to do projects that I would want to go see. Well, it's interesting that you said that because I know that uh, you're a fog. So, can you tell the audience what the fo what fog stands for? Fog friend of fog was uh, friends of Gary. Um, Gary Marshall was uh, one of my uh, heroes and a, and a tremendous mentor to me. Um, I met him uh, the night Reefer Madness won uh, the Ovation Award for Best Director. He was presenting it on stage with Jane Leaves and uh, Faith Ford. And uh, afterwards, we were backstage taking photos, and he said give me a call and I gave him a call and that was it from that point on he 
took every call, answered every question. Uh, I had the good fortune of directing him. Uh, he was one of our leads in Race to Witch Mountain. Yes. Uh, and we Which was a remake from the 1975? I like to of consider a, it a continuation of ah, the story. There you I go. had the original kids, Ike yes. Eisenman and Kim Richards. I was a big fan. Uh, I, I had them right. in the movie playing sort of adult versions of themselves. But uh, you And then he came him. in and did uh, uh, Live and Maddie, I got to direct him in that, where he played a director. And uh, so every step of the way, it was it. But Friends of Gary Fogg was something that taught me that uh, it's important to surround yourself with people you love. And if you look at every one of his movies, uh, cast-wise and behind the scenes, it's all people that have been really a part of his life. He does so much amazing work, charity work and theater, that a lot of his theater actors would do it. So when I started directing, it was the same for me. And almost all of my movies, television projects, a lot of my theater actors will come in and be in the show with us. And so I can look around at the casting crew and usually see a lot of familiar faces. And didn't you credit him, too, with also helping you kind of, uh, he was a, a trailblazer, if you will, to combine television, film, and theater to he, kind of put that was. whole he, package he, together. He was one of not only a trailblazer, but also somebody who was doing it so well. He not only directed theater, he directed operas. And if you look at the history of television, uh, especially television that he had impact on, you know, from Odd Couple to, you know, Mork and Mindy to Happy Days <laughs> to Laverne and Shirley, you know, I grew up watching his magic. And you look at movies with Pretty Woman from, you know, Princess Diaries to Runaway Bride to, uh, you know, Valentine's Day. So many of the great films that he did, he just could bounce from one to the next to the next. And then as an actor, he was just ridiculously funny. But he, you know, the world was a canvas. Uh, and uh, we're doing a project right now with Henry Winkler. Uh, and every time Henry comes to our office, I just light up because immediately I'm taken back to just thinking of yeah. Gary. And, right. and I feel there's a picture in my office now of Gary on the wall. And uh, I feel that uh, sometimes if I'm questioning what I would do in a moment, it's a lot of what would Gary do. Oh, and, that's beautiful. Uh, and he, wasn't, he was hard. He would tell you sometimes <laughs> when he didn't think it was, eh, do that. Do, uh -huh. Why are you worried about that? You can do. He had a bench outside. At Disney made a bench, the Gary Marshall bench. And it was outside editorial at uh, Disney Studios in Los Angeles. And one day I was having a day, and I remember contacting him. To, and I said, I want to know if I could sit on your bench today. Wow. And, and he said, OK. But not long. Other people need to sit. So go and sit and tell me what you think. But uh, I will forever uh, be grateful for the guidance that, uh, that he showed me. And you're also known for that. You're also known for helping your interns along the way and really being a caring director. You've built quite a team here of people that really genuinely like each other. Your friends here, it seems. I don't like any of them. No. What's important they is like that you. they like me. Got it. And I put out a note every night as a reminder of that in case there's any question. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, look, we are, um, we are not in the business of curing cancer. We're in the business of entertaining, which has a tremendous impact for people around the world. Um, but that being said, you know, we're lucky. I'm doing what I dreamed of doing my whole life. So... I feel like you want to provide an environment for family. We are together, whether it's a film, television, or theater, 18, 19, 20 hours a day, you are with people sometimes five, six, seven days a week for months on end. Um, so you got to learn to sort of do it. Family squabble. Families sometimes don't always like each other. But in the end, I'm very proud of the families that we built. And I'm proud at our company, at Oopstone Us Productions, that uh, I can honestly say I'm friends with the people that, uh, that I work with. Uh, I can say that uh, it's a great environment. And anytime we have new blood that sort of comes in, it's a lot of fun to see them sort of integrate up into our world. Absolutely. That's so. I was going to make a little joke about it. I was just going to say, as long as they smell good, as long as there's good deodorant around, but, no, but that's I, I knew that not you're being a joke. That is actually true. important. That part is, <laughs> but that's in the little reminder memo that I do every night to them about <laughs> with the smiley yeah. face. A lot of practical joking going on behind the scenes here. Are you um, a practical jokester of, of you know? Sorts? I'm not a. I, I'm not an. Uh, I have set up some practical jokes. Um, uh, I, I'm more of a keep the mood light day. Okay. So I'd say that. We do practical jokes all the time, but I'm less of a like snake coming out of a can. Gotcha. Uh, unless it was Anaconda, currently available <laughs> on DVD.
Um, but I, uh, <laughs> but, but I think it's more just keeping a really light mood. And uh, one joke that uh, I do remember that I re that took a lot of time to set up, but okay. there was a scene in Race to Witch Mountain where the Rock was going through uh, this uh, underground cavern, and it was really crazy, and he was being chased by this monster, um, Simon, and that things were blowing up, and he was looking for the two kids, uh, Anna Sophia Robin, uh, Alexander Ludwig, great actors, and and he was looking for him, and he's hunting and he's hunting, and all of a sudden I had Madison Pettis, who was our little girl from Game Plan, there wearing her jersey from the previous movie and he, Dwayne's running down looking for the kids and all of a sudden Madison runs out she must have been eight or nine she runs through the forest and she's screaming Joe Joe and without missing a beat he's like there you are Peyton and he picks her up and he stays in character and I think he said something like you're in the wrong movie and then he kind of kept running uh, but so I enjoy if I can make it something elaborate yes I definitely will enjoy that beautiful so here we are, season two, and it's global. It's universal. It's intergalactic. So you do Kevin Can Wait. You've got the pilot going. You had a successful first year. How did it feel when they called and said, we're doing it again? It felt like I could pay my Discover bill. Yes. And that just was because there was a, it was a, a there was a question. And uh, I was like, oh. um, you know, anytime, it, listen, it's, subjective when it comes to entertainment uh, and especially comedy. Um, uh, it's the hardest to me of the art forms and it is an art form in that. If I show you a documentary of uh, some painful subject that elicits tears, I would hope it elicits tears because you're human and so I would think everybody would have the same reaction. If I show you a comedy, I don't necessarily know if I'm going to laugh at what you laugh at and vice versa. And there are movies I might say are my favorite comedies of all time and you might be like, oh, I didn't laugh. Or I go see a movie or watch a TV show and it just doesn't tickle my funny bone, but it might make you laugh. And that's, that's the great fun of the entertainment industry, a little bit something for everybody. So with Kevin Can Wait, you know, first season we were so happy that we were getting our sea legs, so happy that we were finding an audience, so happy that, you know, Kevin James, is just one of the funniest people, not only on camera, but off camera. And he's also one of the nicest people and gracious people that I've ever had the, the pleasure to meet. And I've met enough people that can be you in can that tell. category. Um, so you're excited when you find an audience. We were excited that we had done so well. And then you cross your fingers. Do people want to see that again? Do they want to see the show in another incarnation? Will it keep growing? And you always want a show to grow. You always want yourself to grow creatively. So when we got told that we got the second season pickup, we were thrilled and your heart kind of goes. And then like any job, right. it's like that moment where you're like, I got the pickup and now it's work. Now yeah. it's like, all right, <laughs> now I'm, it's the moment when you're like, someday I'd like to interview people. And then it's the day where you're like, today's the day right. I got in there. Like it's pouring rain out. Really? Do we have to interview today? So I, I know all jobs have a moment like that, that occurs. This season's going to be a little different. You took what was working, and now you've gone into a new direct, a little bit new direction. Um, how are you explaining that? Are to you the referring audience? to my changing of cologne? Uh, no, I was referring to the Paco um, Rabanne. I'm in, the Paco I'm Rabanne in, was working, yes. <laughs> Wait. and I changed it up. You do smell and good. went for the <laughs> Ralph Lauren polo uh, just to mix it up, and I wanted to feel like it was 1987 all over again. Um, I think uh, when it comes to creative changes in a show. Yes. Um, we loved what we were doing last season and the show was growing and you know you when you do a film you have the a period of time where you're locked into this is it this is my presentation i'm going to spend uh i'll do two pages a day every day so if i'm only doing two pages three pages a day shooting maybe it's a lot of time i can fix it on the spot i can keep Tweak. creatively tweaking you do a play you have the benefit, this glorious opportunity where you have maybe five, six weeks of rehearsal. Every day you come in and you make discoveries. And you can make changes and discoveries. When you're doing a multicam and you're shooting live audience every Friday night, you are learning. You're learning on the fly, you're growing, you're seeing what's that character needs, what, what's interacting. We were so blessed last season because from head to toe we had remarkable uh, actors, yes. uh, great guest stars, great writing. And then we step back and you start thinking, all right, what, what's working in terms of what would you do next season? Mm -hmm. So anytime you make a change, um, 
you're hoping the change is to just continue the character's growth. And, you know, we started with a show about Kevin Gable, and you want to take him on with that journey. And I'm, I'm always excited about challenges, and I was so excited. You know, we just finished our third episode, and I can honestly say I feel like we have continued to, to push ourselves and creatively uh, I think the audience is going to really enjoy what they have to see. Well both the audience at home that's going to be watching and the audience here. I got a chance to be a member of your live audience and it just almost seems like the energy in this whole entire room is adding something to it. It's um, a collaboration if you will between the people that are watching here live and the audience at home it's it's really we what have, you've created is unique we have more nudity on the live show is that, on friday nights there you that's go. a big I part that. of it wait, wait. topless audience is a big <laughs> part of, and pizza. Pizza, pizza and yes. nudity. And candy. Tanja, and, and you candy. give out candy. And you got yeah, Joey yeah, Cola. Candy's a, like a thing. And you got Joey Cola. Um, <laughs> you know, if, when you do a show like this in Los Angeles, uh, it's a community that has grown up in many ways as an audience to multicam. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like going down to see a show. If you were visiting in town, you could go down and they give tickets away. And if you live there and long enough, you'll have a friend who's in the show or somebody else is in the show. So, uh, when we came here, the, you know, we were literally taking a warehouse that, like, nothing was here. I heard and no we, air conditioning either. They the, had to, like, cut the holes in there, the walls and there, add air conditioning. There was nothing here but these walls and this roof. This is not soundproof. The notion of soundstage is that I cannot hear rain. Mm -hmm. The notion of this stage <laughs> is I can hear sneezes outside. Um, and we work with it. It's Long Island. Um, but we put in the, the seats, and all of a sudden, uh, we, we had an audience. And that audience was so excited to come and be a part of something yes. that it's just been great. So we as a group anxiously look forward to our Friday nights because it's a partnership. Our job is to bring some words to you and some staging and characterization. Your job is to participate and watch and hopefully kind of grow from that. And together, we'll have a good time. And I, I have been so blown away by the Long Island audiences. I've yet to have a show here where we've been like, uh... Uh, so we are knocking wood for more. You're, you're good for us. You're good for our economy. You're good for everything. You're good for morale. Um, one of the things that you're also known for is your involvement with Heathers. And there was just a new stage uh, of that at Five Towns College, right down the street from here. I want to talk about Heathers. Uh, so not only have you done many films, but why was Heathers an important story for you to be involved in? Um, it was one of my favorite movies. Uh, so I was a massive fan of, of the project to begin with, and moons ago it was brought to, brought to me uh, by our producers who wanted to know if I thought it could become a musical. And I didn't even hesitate, I just sort of said, yes. <laughs> and uh, I was lucky enough to re-team with one of my partners on Reefer Madness, Kevin Murphy. Uh, and we brought in Larry O'Keefe, uh, who had done such a wonderful job on Legally Blonde and was a longtime friend of ours. Uh, and we set about working, and then we included the original screenwriter, Dan Waters, and uh, the original producer, Denise Denovi, and at some point, all the original cast from Christian Slater, Winona Ryder, uh, they all came to see the show in various incarnations in L.A. or New York, and uh, it's been one of the great joys for me. We just were in London uh, this past uh, summer. We were workshopping it at Andrew Lloyd Webber's Theater, The Other Palace. And so that was very exciting to be doing Heathers and look up and there's Andrew Lloyd Webber looking back at you and that was <laughs> exciting. And then we took that version and uh, and we've been very lucky to be licensed kind of all over the country uh, uh, for amateur rights. And we've done a Heather's 101, more of a high school version of it. But that version, everything that we learned in our workshop, our first official new version of the rewrite was done right here in Long Island and uh, directed by one of our original Heather's cast members, Dan Dominici, who is not just a ridiculously talented actor, uh, and I'm not just saying that because he's from Long Island, and I'm not just saying that because he's a good guy, but he's also a great director. And oh, that's so, very nice. and then he, of course, you know, they did it there. The, um, uh, it's the, nice theater the group, there. that yeah. great theater, they had about, uh, uh, I think two nights, three nights of performances, we came. So the kids got a, a packed house and they also had myself, they had Larry O'Keefe in the house. So they had to do Heathers in front of us. And then afterwards, we spent much time with them and we just 
Loved it. It's the first Heather's uh, show that I had seen that I did not direct. Um, so that was a lot of fun for me. And as we continue the bigger picture of what the next incarnation of Heather's on the big stage will be, we are loving the smaller stages that are doing the show. But that one was special. It was special that it was here in Long Island. We got to go to Chris and Tony's for dinner right before. Chris and Tony's. A hell of a good meal. There you go. Check them out. Ask for Chris. <laughs> so we uh, and eat my cake. We're going to have those French macaroons <laughs> after the interview too. So thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, so it was just it was fun. And for me, doing musicals are a crucial element of kind of who I am. I won't. I sometimes I'm asked the difference between if I love film or television or theater, one or the other, and I love them all. There you and, go. And I don't have. They're equally challenging, they're equally exciting, they're equally my babies. Um, I, so I, I never am able to differentiate. I was gonna bring a red scrunchie. You know, oh, have, nice. you know, you know. <laughs> By the way, I have, I, I, I probably have uh, more red scrunchies than my wife, who should have red scrunchies. <laughs> I probably have more red scrunchies. You can always use them to like shoot people if they're if they're not like doing what you want on on the set, possibly. You know, Donna, you don't have to tell me how yeah. I can use those scrunchies. <laughs> I think I've discovered over the years every possible scrunchie use available. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I am so enjoying my visit with you. This is a lot of fun. I'm like almost crying and I'm like my mascara is probably running. It's By okay. the way, I'm, <laughs> I've spent my life just used to women crying in front of me. So this is maybe my comfort zone. What have you not accomplished yet? What is on Andy Fickman's like to-do list of life? I finally gave up on my dream to do the luge in the Olympics. I feel that is not happening the way I thought it was gonna happen. Uh, um, you know, I, I feel like it's just all in front of me. Okay. I feel like I, every, back to Gary Marshall, I'd ask Gary once if he, with all of his knowledge, when he would do a movie, would it make it easier? And Gary would be like, no, everything I learned on the last movie, there's no bearing on the next movie. And it's true. So I feel I'm a, in learning mode all the time. I'm in the middle of writing a script right now for a studio and I'm loving the process and I love writing, but I'm focused on that. Being here, this is home right now and I love, uh, my wife and I had never lived in Long Island and uh, now we, we're happy residents of Long Island, uh, spend more time here than we do in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I've probably spent more time in the Roosevelt Field Mall than I am. I've eaten at the Carl Place Diner for an excellent meal. <laughs> Carl Place. <laughs> and uh, there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, it's all about sort of creatively, the only thing that is the same with all creativity, as you know, is it doesn't happen overnight. There is no, for as long as I've been in the business, and it used to be when I was in the business starting, I'd be like, who are those people who would say as long as they've been in the business? <laughs> and now I'm like, all right, now I'm that guy who's like, for as long as I've been in the business. <laughs> Let me tell you about before there was the intranet. Um, so it, everything is, you gotta roll it uphill. You do. Everything, uh, movies are harder to get made now. Television is harder to get made. Theater, it's all harder to get made. Um, things are maybe a little bit more expensive at times, you have to get more creative. So that just means you have to double down your efforts. I'm lucky that I love what I do. And so by passionately loving what I do, I know if I'm putting in a 22 hour day, I'm putting in a 22 hour day, it's what I wanted to do. Uh, it's also the very clear re realization I have no other skills. I could not work anywhere. If I had a nine to five job, I'd have to buy pants. I feel that would be a problem. I'd have to find a tie. I'd have to show up at nine o'clock. At five o'clock, I'd have to leave. Uh, I'd have to be responsible. So this is good that I'm in the entertainment industry. And I would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Liv and Maddie, and especially when you had Patty Duke on. So Duke and Dove, that must have been like a moment for you also. Probably, well Liv and Maddie will forever be, uh, I just hit my mic. By the way, oh, how do you know you're a bad director? When you pop your own <laughs> mic. This is why I have no other skills. And it, the, the truth is revealed. All a director does is this, action. Moving on. That's it. That's it. That's, you really, if you can you do those really three well. and do them in order, 
They're going to be fine. Uh, Liv and Maddie, uh, so proud of that show. Uh, show that we helped create from scratch. Uh, we set Liv and Maddie in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, where my mom's whole family is from, uh, and that was sort of special. Um, but from the very beginning, we talked about it as the Patty Duke show. As a matter of fact, bought all the Patty Duke uh, episodes and showed our uh, remarkable star, Dove Cameron. And there she was watching, you know, there's Patty. And so we started having conversations, and we had wonderful guest stars from Kristen Bell to Kevin James on our show. But we all talked about wouldn't it be amazing if we could get Patty Duke to come and do our show? And we tracked her down and we had a lot of conversations. Uh, some of my sort of favorite memories are realizing I'm talking to Patty Duke, um, having that moment, moment of yeah. like, I'm just talked to Patty Duke. Like I, <laughs> and then slowly but surely she was trying to, you know, hear a little bit about the show. She asked if I, if, if we shot it differently than, you know, it was 50 years ago to the day uh, that they did uh, Petty Duke from Lib and Maddie and she assumed technology had changed. Um, and I laughed and I said, it, for us, it hasn't. We are actually shooting it in the, we're not shooting it on green screen. I'm literally shooting it the way that they shot your show. The only difference is there they had doubles that didn't move. <laughs> So anytime Patty was talking to herself, they'd see this big bullet head behind her and poor actress who was standing there. We cast two uh, remarkable actresses, uh, Shelby and Emmy, to work opposite Dove so that there was creative interaction. And we learned how to get the camera just enough to where you could see enough of the face, but not too much. Ah. Uh, and so by the time Patty agreed to come on and do the show as both grandmother and great aunt, um, it was, uh, it was just a great experience for everybody. And when she passed away, uh, it was hard, but we were also so thrilled to have been part of the latter part of her, her, her acting career. And she brought so much joy and energy to the set that uh, she'll be with all of us in our hearts. And I just went the other day, I took my son Matthew to Broadway because we watched Chocolate, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate yes. Factory. And there was another big loss that you had this year as well. Can you tell us about why uh, he was so important to you? Yeah, so Gene Wilder, my Willy Wonka. Yeah. Uh, Gene, I got to uh, head development for Gene uh, at a production company called Pal Mel, which stood for my pal Mel Brooks. Um, uh, it was the biggest learning curve. I had just been out of here from college. I'd been a tour guide at Universal Studios. I was in the mailroom of, of an agency. Um, and then I got my first opportunity. Uh, and I was working with one of my all-time greatest heroes ever, from producers to Blazing Saddles to Young Frankenstein, uh, Silver Streak, Stir Crazy, Willy Wonka. Like this, this was a lifetime of learning. And uh, so for several years, I got to work with him and uh, his producing partner, Susan Ruskin, who I continued working on eventually after uh, Gene shut the, the company down uh, and retired. Uh, so his loss was a hard loss, but he was also probably the first major celebrity that I ever had, like a movie star that had in her. So, you know, those days of just staring at him for the first, <laughs> like he'd come in and I'd be like, uh, I should probably stop staring at him. He, he's my boss now. And it was a small office. And then he'd sit in his office and he'd play piano and then he'd just talk movies. And then I'd sit there and be like, I think I just spent the whole day talking about movies with Gene. But he and Susan really gave me an education. I grew up in Texas not really watching foreign films or knowing a lot about the history of comedy. Uh, I knew Marx Brothers, I knew Three Stooges, Laurel and Hardy, uh, Abbott Costello, but not like, I didn't know the Ritz Brothers, I didn't know all this sort of legacy. And, uh, and Gene would educate me, and at that time, Blockbuster Video was a thing. Yeah. And I would go uh, and get whatever movie, and sometimes he'd have movies waiting for me, and I would watch and feel like, wow, I just learned something. So uh, it was great. I remember we were doing Reefer Madness in New York rehearsing, and he was rehearsing a play in the same building. And all of a sudden, uh, somebody came, uh, Dan Studney, our other um, co-creator of Reefer Madness, Dan runs in, he goes, I think your old boss is in the hall across the way from us. And I was like, old boss, who are you talking about? And he goes, Gene, run wow. down the thing. And there's Gene. And then, the, you know, we got caught up. And then I'm back in the, the room with everybody and rehearsing and Christian Bell and everybody. And the door opens. And I'm working, working, working. And all of a sudden, it's just silence. And I'm thinking, that's right, people. That's how you should treat me. And then I realized Gene Wilder was standing <laughs> behind me. And I'm, uh, 
busted. <laughs> and uh, Jean came in and watched rehearsal and, and was so kind with everybody. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing that story, and thank you for sharing this time with us. Oh, you're I, welcome. I think you're just fabulously gifted, and Thanks. you can take that as a compliment and not have to, you know, say, oh, I am fabulously gifted. Really, truly, I enjoy your work, and it has been a pleasure to visit Aww. with you, and I wish you all the best. You know, happy journeys. I hope we get to work together. I, I'd I, love maybe to. we will. So. I got your, listen, you got I got number? your <laughs> number, I got your headshot, and more importantly, <laughs> what all directors want, bribery with food. There you go. So, in pretty good shape. Thank you to our audience for watching. We hope you enjoyed our visit with Andy Fickman. I'm Donna Drake signing off from Live It Up.